The working day begins for one of the men who in Spain are as legendary as they are infamous. El cobrador del frac en este país es tan conocido como la Coca-Cola. En cuanto te pones, llamas por teléfono a alguien y le dices que eres el cobrador del frac, este individuo ya se pone en tensión. Debt collectors in tales have been around for 30 years. The company's heyday was during the 2008 financial crisis, when thousands of Spaniards went bankrupt. Si este señor sigue sin querer reunirse con nosotros, viene la parte que te interesa. Y es que aparece un compañero así disfrazado, con un maletín que lo verás ahora del cobrador del frac, y se posiciona en la puerta de su negocio o en la puerta de su domicilio. De tal suerte que todo el mundo entiende que debes dinero. Hay una tipología infinita de morosos. Está desde el moroso, desde el moroso más noble que se ha arruinado y que no tiene dinero y no puede pagar y te pide por favor que no puede pagar y realmente a ti te da pena y sientes lástima y empatizas con él, hasta el moroso más sinvergüenza que puedas pensar que tiene que puede tener 4000 euros en el bolsillo y no te va a dar ni un céntimo. Hagas lo que hagas. In the worst cases, debtors are confronted on the street. Disculpa. Un segundito, por favor. Today, the whole world is in the same position as the Spaniard who can't pay. Private individuals, companies and whole countries have been struggling with steadily rising debts for over 15 years. The problem has been severely aggravated by the corona pandemic and the war in Ukraine. Does this mean the world is about to collapse under a huge mountain of debt? The world's total debt currently exceeds $300 trillion. That's a colossal number with 14 zeros. To pay off this debt, everyone in the world would have to work for three and a half years. To find out what's going on in the world, we decide to explore the stories behind global debt. We want to find out what's happening away from the headlines. We visit people in debt and learn about the dramatic impact it has on their lives. And we go to countries with vast levels of national debt. We want to find out how the lives of ordinary people are affected. Is the situation hopeless? Or are there any ways out of the debt trap? After the financial crisis of 2008, many states fell into debt. Back then, after a phase of unbridled lending in the USA, a property bubble burst. Major banks went bust and the stock market collapsed. The US government had to take on staggering debts to save the economy. The debt crisis in the USA triggered a global chain reaction that still resonates. To trace the long-term impact of the 2008 crisis, we travel to a country where money seems to be no object. The Emirate of Dubai. There, we meet Sajjad Marouf, an estate agent who wants to show us something exquisite. 
a map of the world consisting of artificial islands. In 2003, a state-owned corporation began constructing the world islands and selling them to investors. They wanted to build retreats for the super-rich, palaces like this one. Welcome to Sweden Beach Palace. Welcome to the homes of White King. Only the kings are allowed to stay over here. The palace provides an astonishing refuge from the outdoor temperatures topping 45 degrees Celsius. Scandinavian people, they have a tradition to take sauna to open up the body pores, okay? So we have sauna over here. We can make it as a dry or a steam room. Then immediately, when sauna is done, they have to take an ice bath. So we have our own snow room. That's how you enjoy the snow. So the idea was this, how to bring the whole world in Dubai. So that's Spain. You can see Portuguese over there, and that's France. We try to follow Mr. Maruf's logic, but we find it difficult to make out the outlines of European countries. The sharp contours have eroded away. Since 2008, the project called The World has lain dormant. Nevertheless, one man still wants to keep building on the artificial islands and create a mini-Europe. Josef Kleindienst, an Austrian businessman, has wound up here in the Persian Gulf. Part of his grand vision can already be admired. Welcome to see our Heart of Europe project. I want to point out first the location where we are right now. We are here in the roof of Sweden Beach Palace number one, overlooking the Germany Island, 32 villas on beach and pool. And you can see the Strandkörbe are uh, already waiting for, uh, for tourists. You see here our main island, Europe, hosting our uh, hotels. Monaco Hotel is our first hotel to open, and it's a party hotel, 24-7 party. This is typical of Dubai, the epitome of abundance. A Switzerland beneath palm trees welcoming anyone who wants to take the wealth to the Emirate. Postmodern towers soar up into the sky. They include the tallest building in the world. The Burj Khalifa skyscraper was originally going to be called Burj Dubai, but the prestigious building had to be renamed after the ruler of Abu Dhabi, Sheikh Khalifa. The powerful neighbor helped Dubai out with an emergency loan in 2008. The emirate, with relatively little oil, was on the verge of bankruptcy. Half-finished buildings bear witness to the credit-leveraged madness a few years ago. Instead of lavish real estate, it would have been better to invest in more sensible things, says sovereign debt expert Christoph Trebisch. Eine fundamentale Frage ist, ob die Schulden produktiv eingesetzt werden für Investitionen, etwa in Infrastruktur, in Bildung, in sinnvolle Projekte des Staates, oder ob sie unproduktiv eingesetzt werden, zum Beispiel in Dubai, den Immobilienboom und die dortigen Prestigeprojekte. Und da gibt es viele in der Geschichte immer wieder Episoden für äh, unproduktiven Einsatz von Schulden. Und die gehen dann oft auch mit einer äh, Schuldenkrise einher. When the inevitable crash hit Dubai's real estate market, many international investors pulled out. They included some who'd invested in the painstakingly created world map. Some went bankrupt, 
Others were left with piles of sand whose value plummeted. One even committed suicide during the debt crisis. There are other Europeans, they did not have the trust to stay, or maybe they ran out of money or of funding, and it was not easy in 2008. And then we realized there are chances. When 40 others run away, you have a chance to take over part of their business, for example. Even though the world keeps stalling, life is creeping into it. Recently, another investor began building on the island that represents Argentina. Despite its past as a debtor, Dubai's image hasn't been tarnished. The emirate was lucky to get help so quickly. At the southernmost end of the world lies the undisputed bankruptcy champion of our planet. Argentina has been bankrupt nine times. Sometimes international financiers stepped in. Sometimes no aid was received. We can see here what happens when a state has too much debt to meet its obligations to the poorest people. The slum called Via 31 spreads beneath the motorway bridges in central Buenos Aires. Thousands of Argentines rely on charities. A century ago, Argentina was one of the five richest countries in the world. It has mineral resources and a well-educated population. How could such a country fall so low? Alejandro Berkovich is an economist and radio journalist. He's been studying why Argentina can't escape the debt trap. Argentina is a rich rico, but very desigual. Y las élites, las clases poseedoras de la Argentina, muchas veces se comportan como extranjeros ante sus propios compatriotas. Hay un comportamiento sistemático, especialmente a lo largo del siglo XX, pero históricamente desde la conformación del país, de esa élite llevándose el dinero del país, retirándolo de la Argentina. La verdad es que es un país que termina haciéndose cargo de las deudas de su élite, de su parte más rica, eh, y socializando las pérdidas a la vez que privatiza las ganancias de los momentos buenos. The result is ever higher deficits. And being so badly in debt, Argentina can't always borrow money abroad. But it still has to pay pensions and unemployment benefits. So it uses a trick. Argentina simply prints large amounts of its own currency, the peso. As we can see here, there's a money supply that can be used to buy goods. In order to meet the cost of the state, more and more money is printed. But the quantity of goods remains the same. People can buy more with the new money. Retailers respond to higher demand by raising their prices. Inflation takes hold. Many Argentines can't afford everyday items. So, people meet up to barter. <laughs> Meetings are arranged on Facebook and WhatsApp, and then the group meets here. Instead of money, they use points to determine the value of each item. Clothes, for example, can then be swapped for personal hygiene items and food. Bartering looks set to persist for a long time. 
And in Argentina, there is no end in sight to the price spiral. Inflation is now a serious problem in the Northern Hemisphere too. In wealthy Germany, more and more people are suffering from price rises for energy and food. The share of income that low earners spend on living costs is disproportionately high. That's why the poorest people fall into debt especially often. Duisburg is a city with many over-indebted people in Germany. 16% of its inhabitants are on the debt register, compared to not even half that many in Munich. Frank Wendler, a local jack-of-all-trades, knows firsthand just how bad it is to be hopelessly in debt. Mädchen mit roten Haaren, die musst du fragen, was Liebe ist. Mir macht nach wie vor riesen Spaß, deswegen mache ich noch neue Produktionen, auch was die Musik betrifft. Die Musikgeschichte war ja immer nur ein zweites Bein eigentlich. Es ist schwer in der Musikszene, es gibt einfach zu viele. Und es äh, sind nur wenige, die das Glück haben, die wirklich davon gut leben könnten. Da brauchen wir schon einen Hit. Ja, den habe ich noch nicht gehabt. <lacht> ja, und ich habe mich damals, na, will ich sagen, fast aus der Not heraus selbstständig gemacht, äh, nachdem ich arbeitslos war. For decades, Wendler sold gas canisters. But the business had its pitfalls. Ich bin, muss sagen, von Hause mehr ein Mensch, der so praktisch veranlagt ist. Ich, ich mache alles, ich kann Waschmaschine reparieren oder sonst was, egal. Aber dieser ganze Bürokratismus, Büro und Co. war noch nie so wirklich mein Ding. Dann irgendwann keine Steuererklärung mehr abgegeben, weil man war auch irgendwo überlastet, überfordert. Fate took its course. After a tax audit. He owed a large amount of back tax. Damals kam in den fünf Jahren zusammen, wenn ich das nur so halbwegs im Kopf habe, ich glaube so 65.000. Und dann durch Zinsen und Zinseszins summiert sich das. Ich habe das Geld ja logischerweise nicht gehabt. Naja, dann haben die mich irgendwann so an die Wand gedrückt, dass ich dann irgendwann das Gewerbe abgemeldet habe oder abmelden musste. Dann habe ich dann wirklich alles hingeschmissen, Burnout gehabt. Ja, war dann alles zu viel dann irgendwann, ja. Like its citizens, Duisburg is also struggling with a debt trap. Starting with the crisis in the steel industry in the mid-1980s, things went downhill. And the once affluent city now has an army of unemployed. Germany has been systematically saving for decades. The debt level is low. But the result is potholes, bridges in need of repair, and run-down railways. With Duisburg's drastic cuts now behind it, a consolidation pact has been introduced to make the city more attractive for investors. Nearly half of its debt has been paid off, partly thanks to the development of Duisburg as a logistics hub. The port of Duisburg is the biggest inland port in the world. It lies at the end of the Northern Silk Road, a branch of a huge trade network being set up by China to connect with the rest of the world. Duisburg money is being pumped into the debt-laden budget by cooperation with China. But Chinese collaboration isn't always this beneficial for its partners. This map shows hard-up countries that build infrastructure for the Silk Road by taking out huge loans from Chinese banks.
China expert Thomas Heberer is aware that China's loans can also have a positive effect. Also das ist etwas, was man im Kopf behalten muss, dass die Infrastruktur in Ländern, die sonst keine Mittel dafür haben, natürlich geschaffen wird. Wir haben das Beispiel, der, die Zugverbindung Addis Abeba nach Djibouti zum Hafen. Äh, Äthiopien hat ja selber keinen eigenen Hafen oder von Mombasa nach Nairobi. Und es soll ausgebaut werden auf fünf weitere afrikanische Länder. Das sind positive Dinge und das sollte man auch nicht vergessen, wenn man über Afrika spricht. This is how economic growth is created in Africa. However, China grants loans without assessing whether the recipients can manage the money properly. Hebera finds this problematic. Das ist etwas, was man in dieser Seitenstraßenpolitik Chinas auch kritisieren kann, nämlich dass Projekte finanziert werden, die Prestigeprojekte von Präsidenten afrikanischer Länder sind große Statien äh, oder Paradeplätze oder sonst etwas, die auch finanziert werden müssen und letztendlich diese Schuldenfalle verstärken. In the US, where people think big, debts are breaking all records. During the COVID pandemic, the state's obligations skyrocketed. The debt clock currently reads $33 trillion. <laughs> this amount is still rising and has serious consequences for society, says banker Richard Vague. Growth in debt increases inequality. The reason is that the top 10% of most economies, certainly in the United States, own 60 to 70% of the real estate and stock in that economy. Increased debt levels increase the value of real estate and increase the value of stocks. Financial expert Sandra Navidi understands the impact of unequal wealth distribution on U.S. society. Die Arbeitskraft kann nie so viel Geld generieren wie diese Vermögenswerte. Das heißt, um das auszugleichen und dann noch einigermaßen gut leben zu können, nimmt man Schulden auf, gerade auch hier beliebt in den USA. Durch diese Verschuldung steht man unheimlich unter Druck hier. Man beide Familien, also Vater und Mutter, müssen beide arbeiten. Sie müssen zum Teil mehrere Jobs arbeiten. Sie, also diese, die kalte Hand der Gläubiger sitzt ihnen im Nacken. Sie müssen die Schulden bedienen, damit sie ihr Haus nicht verlieren, damit sie ihre Kreditkarten abbezahlen können. Das heißt, es leidet auch die Lebensqualität darunter. Man ist nicht mehr frei, Entscheidungen zu treffen, sondern alles ordnet sich unter, um diese Schulden bedienen zu können. The weakest in society suffer the most. Mississippi has the highest proportion of poverty in the USA. Known debtors make up 29% of the population, seven percentage points higher than the national average. For Anita Husband, severe debt led to drastic repercussions. Years ago, me and my husband, we were going through financial difficulty. He wasn't working, I was working. I was in between paychecks because I started a new job as an office manager. One morning I came in to work, my truck was being repossessed. Another coworker came in and she said, I'm gonna tell you what to do. She said, write a check for John Doe for 365, get the cash, then when you get paid, replace the cash. Okay, so I did that, and um, payday comes, and of course, you know, I have a million other bills, so I didn't replace the cash back. So, you know, I'm thinking in my head, okay, this is pretty easy. So I started, um, I guess, forming a habit. I would keep my paycheck, and 
I would pay my light bill with the, the, the fake checks or the fraudulent checks. Altogether, Anita embezzled $13,000. Her larceny year was found out. She was sentenced to five years probation and had to pay back the money. She was in a mess because she lost her job. Her husband suffered a stroke and was confined to bed. Anita regularly reported to the probation officer. In return for his services, he expected fees. They have what they call a supervision fee. We have to pay $60 a month. I didn't have it. I didn't even pay on the $13,000 restitution. You know, no one's working. So the probation officer said, well, if you don't have it, that is a violation of your probation because you have to report and pay. So I'm not going to leave my basically paralyzed husband, three little kids, home, so I'm not going to come back. Anita was arrested and put in a restitution center. This means a debt prison in Jackson, Mississippi, where prisoners serve time until they've worked off their debts. These debts might be damages owed to victims of crime or overdue court costs. Even for trifling amounts below $1,000, people can end up in this converted motel. But it has nothing to do with holiday accommodation. It's barbed wire, just like a jail. When you get in, they go through your stuff, just like a jail, a prison. They strip search you, just like a prison. And I never forget this. They bought me there on a Friday. Mother's Day was on a Sunday. So they allowed me one call. I called my son, my old son. And the first thing he said was, Happy Mother's Day, Mother. And that was so heartbreaking because I'm not going to be there. Besides the prison-like conditions in the restitution center, Anita was in for another shock. She was charged $11 a day for board and lodging, which was added to her debts. Inmates even had to pay when the center was seeking employment for them, no matter how long it took. Anita was relieved to get a part-time job at Church's Chicken a fast food restaurant. Anita remembers that she had high hopes of escaping the system. By doing additional tasks, she earned valuable bonus points that could be used to reduce her time in custody. But she had a rude awakening. I was, you know, scrubbing vans. I was working in the um, cafeteria. I was doing everything. Got my merits, so I went to the warden. And um, she read my sentencing paper. Now here I'm thinking, all I had to do is get, you know, so many merits and I can go back to my normal life. She said, no, you have to stay here until $13,000 is paid off. With a part-time hourly wage of $7.25, less detention costs, Anita's release was a distant prospect. It became apparent that she'd have to serve the maximum term of five years in Jackson. Mississippi is joined by states like Iran, Egypt, and Afghanistan that also imprison debtors. Nowhere else does being in debt lead to incarceration. We're interested in finding out what sort of people employ debtors, like Anita from the restitution center. 
businesswoman K.K. Kent has several decades' experience of such temporary workers. When I was 19, I bought my first rental properties, and a lot of them had to be excavated, remodeled, and it was hard to find labor, especially labor that was sober. So the restitution center opened up here in Greenwood when I was 19, and I used to go and get labor to help me do all my day-to-day -day operations, handle my livestock, cows, horses, load hay, unload hay, load feed, unload feed, just stuff you have to do every day when you're on a farm. But the staff she recruits from the restitution center cause her problems. And I may go through four or five before I find one that I'm compatible and I can work with because a lot of them think they're entitled. And as soon as you pick them up, they start asking, can I use your phone? Will you stop at the store and buy me a drink? Will you buy me some cigarettes? And there's been some that I've picked up and hadn't even driven a half a mile that just their demeanor has, I didn't approve of it and I turned around and took them right back and sent them back in and got two more. Some are very appreciative, some are thankful, grateful for everything you do for them. You know, I've had some of them say, you know, if I had a mom like you growing up, you know, my life would have been totally different. I don't try to cure them. I just tell them, you know, you need to pray about yourself. You need to figure out your own self-discipline and do something about yourself. You don't need to look for other people because it's not other people's problem, your problem. Anita Husband was in over her head with her problems. She had to think of something. Otherwise, given the amount of money she owed, it would be years before she was released. $13,000 with a minimum part-time paying job. I said, Anita, you need a plan. You know, you need, you need a plan, you need a plan. I just took my chances and ran. But the challenges were huge. She was only allowed to leave to go to work. She was strictly searched twice a day. And she only got $10 a week for personal use. They used to give us a roll of quarters. You couldn't have dollars. So every morning, I would wear my hair in a ponytail. I would put the roll of quarters in my hair because, you know, in between the ponytail, I would leave with the roll of quarters. Come back, I would change the quarters for dollars. I would roll the dollars or two fives, put it in my hair because I can get change at work. I hand wash my clothes, you know, stuff that I would take the $10 for, I would, you know, do without. So I saved up enough for a bus ticket. This one particular day I planned to leave, I had on my church's uniform, but I had on a pair of blue jeans and a shirt under my church's chicken uniform. So I got a friend to take me to the bus station, and I got on the bus and I came to Biloxi. Eventually, Anita was arrested there and had to serve part of her suspended sentence in an ordinary prison. After nine months, she was released. Her debts were canceled. She doesn't have a good word to say about the system of restitution centers. My debt was pretty large, but there's been people that's been um, at the restitution with maybe a $2,000 debt, and three years later, they're still in the restitution. You say, well, one day I'm going to get to go home and, you know, be with my family, but you don't know when. I feel like restitution centers should be wiped out. It's just an undercover slavery.
the systemic discrimination of black people after slavery continues to this day. It's not just the neglected cemeteries of the freed slaves, like this one in New Jersey, that bear witness to this. More than a quarter of blacks can't get loans at all, compared to just 17% of whites. And in black neighborhoods, debt collectors pursue debtors, especially often and hard. Court cases are more frequent than for whites. Differences in the USA concern not only skin color, but also generations. In the majority white middle class, 20-somethings are groaning under tuition fees, which are higher than ever. The cost of student loans in the US is rising sharply. In 2006, American students owed half a trillion dollars in student loan debt. This figure has since risen to $1.7 trillion. In den USA sehen wir, dass die Mittelschicht in den letzten 20 bis 30 Jahren kaum Einkommenszuwächse hatte. Also wir sehen da eine wirkliche Stagnation. Äh, gleichzeitig steigen die Schulden immer weiter an, äh, weil Gesundheit, Bildung äh, immer teurer werden zu finanzieren. Und äh, wenn ich also stagnierende Einkommen habe und gleichzeitig wachsende Schuldenstände, dann äh, kommt es bei immer mehr Haushalten zu Überschuldungssituationen, zu Verarmungssituationen. Und dieser American Dream, äh, den gibt es kaum noch. Es schaffen nur sehr, sehr wenige Leute aus der Mittelschicht, sich wirklich hochzuarbeiten und dann auch aus ihren Schulden so rauszuwachsen. Äh, es ist also eine sehr schwierige Situation für weite Teile der amerikanischen Bevölkerung in den letzten 20 bis 30 Jahren. If the government taxes individuals, it means those individuals are able to spend less. And a government uses that to pay off debt, The government itself is not using those tax dollars to spend more, so the math is obvious. The folks being taxed spend less, the government spending the same, GDP shrinks. So tax where you repay debt actually contracts GDP and creates the opposite effect that you want. But what about starting with government spending? Couldn't states just save like mad until their debts have disappeared? Im Grunde genommen, wenn eine Wirtschaft sehr verschuldet ist, ist sie auch fragiler und anfälliger. Und häufig, wenn man dann noch Sparmaßnahmen einführt, dann führt das zu größerer Arbeitslosigkeit, die Wirtschaft wird gedrosselt. Also häufig bewirkt das das Gegenteil von dem, was man eigentlich erreichen will. Much of what looks like a solution can actually be harmful. If so, how can we get control of the global debt problem? Perhaps there are old ideas outside the world of finance. This leads us to a synagogue in Brooklyn. Sandra Navidi meets the rabbi, Emily Cohen. So, I guess you could say that debt isn't anything new in society. If we go back all the way to some of our earliest texts, you find this discussion of debt. So there's a concept called Shemitah. And what Shemitah is, is a land rest. It's this idea that for six years you plant grain, you plant your, your crops, you harvest them as you normally would, and then in the seventh year you don't plant anything. It's a time where the land is supposed to get a chance to reset. And as part of that process, as part of that reset, there's also remission of debt. So there's this idea that any debt that you have, that you've taken on during the six years leading up to the Shemitah year, is released in the seventh year. 
It is unlikely that this debt remission was ever implemented to the letter. But the ideal of this, the ideal of saying that people sometimes will be in debt, that there will be people who are in need, and that ultimately that can't be something that continues forever. I think that that ideal is something to strive for, even if we haven't figured out how yet. Objectors claim that debt remission might be an invitation to get recklessly into debt. But financial experts disagree. So the moral hazard argument is the one that is always advanced. If we give an inch, borrowers will take a mile. Irresponsible behavior will proliferate. Uh, and yet when we examine the facts, we see that that's not the case. Bankruptcy is a miserable experience in the best of circumstances for the average individual borrower. It's not something they go into lightly. And in fact, when we examine uh, bankruptcy, it relates to just two or three key things most of the time. He unexpected health emergency, unexpected job loss, uh, and divorce. If those are the things that constitute you know, almost all bankruptcies, uh, that's not evidence that there's folks out there purposely, listen, I'll lose my job or I'll have a healthcare emergency in order to get out of my debt. This just doesn't happen. Debt cuts for individuals are often advisable out of compassion, but they also make sense for the general public. Die Forschung in den letzten Jahren hat gezeigt, dass das Schicksal vieler einzelnen Haushalte sehr wichtig ist für das Gesamtsystem. Also wir haben etwa in der Finanzkrise viel zu sehr auf die großen Banken geschaut, dort große Rettungspakete aufgelegt. Und Forschung in den USA zeigt, dass es sehr viel effektiver gewesen wäre, bei den Haushalten, bei den Privatleuten anzusetzen, die zu entschulden, die zu mehr Konsum zu animieren und da anzusetzen, also eher Privatleute retten als Banken. Das ist tatsächlich, es gibt einige faszinierende Arbeiten, die das sehr systematisch zeigen können. We're back in Duisburg, the stronghold of debt. One of those who's undergone personal bankruptcy is Frank Wendler. The pop singer and failed gas retailer was overwhelmed by a mountain of debt. Eventually, he contacted debt counselor Adam Kafora, who helped him file for personal bankruptcy. Ah, oh, Herr Wendler, ich grüße Sie. Wie geht's Ihnen? Ja, bitte muss, nehmen Sie muss, Platz. Muss. Ja. Ach ja, es ist ja schön, dass man Haben Sie mal schön das mitgebracht? Wie geht's Ihnen überhaupt? Ja, soweit jetzt äh, ganz gut. Ja. Ich habe es jetzt langsam realisiert, dass es wohl läuft, die Insolvenz von daher. Das ist alles gelaufen. Ja. Das haben die eröffnet. Wunderbar, so wie es sein soll. Ja. Das waren einige Schulden, ne? das waren um die 100.000? Ja, das hat sich ja summiert. Das waren ja damals 2009, ca. 65. Und dann hat sich das natürlich in den zehn Jahren äh Von 65.000 auf 100.000, glaube ich. Ja, über, über 100. Oder, um 100. Ja, oder 120. Die ganzen Gebühren, die ja, ganzen Ja, durch die Aufschläge, ganzen Gebühren, ja klar. Da muss ja. man sich reintun, ja. Ja, klar. Wie, wie soll man denn sonst aus den Schulden rauskommen? Ja, das keine Chance. Unmöglich. Wie belastend ist das denn für Sie gewesen, nochmal diese ganzen Schulden mit sich zu tragen? Ja, es ist schon insofern belastend, weil man man ist ja nicht mehr frei. Ja, man, ja. man schleppt das mit sich rum. Man hat keine Chance mehr, mit, mit dem Hintern hochzukommen. Was passiert danach? Richtig. Genau das, was ich gesagt ja. habe. Ja. Gerichtsvollzieher, ja. psychischer Druck, Angst vor dem Briefkasten. Ja. Haben Sie auch Angst vor dem Briefkasten? Ja, ja, ja. Da kam auch so ein Déjà-vu. Ja. Ich gehe so über die Straße und dann steht da einer äh, vor der Haustüre mit seiner Post und sehe so einen gelben Brief. Den oh, Mann. Und da, da ging mir das dann direkt wieder durch den Kopf. Boah, das war für mich so ein, so ein, so ein Hass da drauf irgendwo. Ja. Ja. Äh, wie viele Briefe ich davon hatte? Ja. Ich weiß, als sie, als sie zu uns kam, bei so hoher Summe, bei über 100.000, haben wir ja. gesagt, gut, Privatinsolvenz. Und da sind sie aus der Nummer einfach raus. Ja, und man hat wieder so ein bisschen äh, Sieht man Licht gewisse, im Tunnel. Ja, so ein bisschen Licht <lacht> im Tunnel, wo man dann auch sagen kann, okay, jetzt kannst du wenigstens wieder ein bisschen leben, jetzt kannst du arbeiten. Genau. Du hast nicht mehr den Druck im Nacken. Ja. Okay. Ich hab einen gesucht nach dir. 
After three years, Frank Wendler will be debt free. He's found a new rewarding job as an ambulance driver. And in his private life too, things have taken a turn for the better. Ich dann später meine jetzige Frau kennengelernt, habe ich vor zwei Jahren dann geheiratet habe. Ich hab gesucht nach dir, getrunken von dir. Du ist ein Leben im Moment hier. Die Forschung in den letzten Jahren hat gezeigt, dass es bei privater Überschuldung wichtig ist, schnell einzugreifen durch Insolvenzverfahren, durch staatliche Rettungspakete. Das hat gesamtwirtschaftlich sehr positive Effekte. Also man sollte da nicht zu lange warten. Dasselbe gilt auch für Staaten. Ein solcher Schuldenschnitt ist eine sehr effektive Art und Weise, eine, eine Schuldenkrise zu lösen. Investoren sind dann wieder bereit, in das Land zu gehen. Auch im Land ist eine höhere Bereitschaft, wieder zu investieren. Und dadurch kommt das Wachstum zurück. Und dann kann man auch aus dem Rest der Schulden heraus wachsen. Beispiele sind Uruguay Anfang der 2000er. Da war die Krise in anderthalb Jahren bewältigt. Oder auch Ecuador jetzt in der Corona-Krise. Das wurde innerhalb von wenigen Monaten wurde der Schuldenschnitt verhandelt. Und die haben jetzt die Krise auch schon überwunden. But even if all the debts in the world were written off, how could the endless cycle of over-indebtedness snapping shut every few years be stopped? Is it possible to imagine a world in which much less debt is incurred? In the African neighborhood in Paris, known as Goutte d'Or, they're looking for an answer. Aita Magasa, who runs an estate agency for homes in Africa, believes in a traditional solution. Her clients, all French citizens of African origin, had problems investing in Africa. The banks refused to get involved. C'est vrai que quand on va voir des banques, les banques elles vont pas accepter tout de suite de dire oui parce que euh, bah déjà en général c'est pour un investissement en Afrique. Elles sont très frileuses. Et les banques en Afrique, euh, la problématique des banques en Afrique, c'est que leurs taux d'intérêt sont très 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 élevés. Et donc euh, voilà, de, ça commence à 8 à, et ça peut monter à 13 euh, même voire 20 %. Et donc il fallait trouver une autre solution alternative. Et la solution alternative a été celle-ci c'est euh, de pouvoir permettre à des personnes euh, qui ont envie d'acheter un terrain, regrouper toutes ces personnes-là, par exemple faire un groupe de 20 personnes qui vont euh, voilà, cotiser tous les mois la même somme, comme pour des tontines. Tontines are traditional African saving schemes where women join together and pay in a fixed amount at each meeting. Each time, the money collected is distributed to one of the participants, who can spend it as she chooses. Aita Magasa applied the centuries-old system of tontine to property purchases. Moi, j'ai su trouver quelque chose qui s'adapte plus au continent africain avec les solutions des tontines, parce que les les personnes de la communauté africaine. Elles connaissent déjà ce système-là. C'est un système qui est traditionnel, ancré dans les mœurs, qu'on connaît. Il fallait juste en fait le professionnaliser, le rendre, euh, bah, le rendre en fait euh, avec un contrat, le contractualiser, le rendre formel. It states that Aita's clients must pay in 250 euros every month. In turn, 5,000 euros will be distributed to each of the 20 group members to finance a house or land in Africa. None of her clients has to go into debt for a home. This is an unbeatable advantage over the usual financing system. We learn that the principle of tontine also works in Europe at Felicidibe's hairdressing salon. Aita visits the resourceful lady for whom a bank loan was never an option to finance the shop. C'est pas ça, on peut pas aller prendre des dettes à la banque parce que de un ils vont te demander des documents 
Et ça, c'était mon, ça, 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 ça fait mon deuxième salon. D'accord. Ah, c'est ton deuxième Oui, coup, que c'est grâce à la tentative. Et avec la, avec la tentative. Financé. Ça fait plaisir d'entendre ça. Donc, en fait, en plein Paris, ouais. tu as deux salons ouais. que tu as financés avec de... sans les banques. Oui. These two women show how our financial system can become more people-friendly. But a world without any debt at all might be illusory. Perhaps it's not even desirable. Eine Welt ohne Schulden ist letztendlich eine Welt ohne Kapitalismus. Und der Kapitalismus hat äh, trotz all seiner Probleme uns sehr viel Wohlstand gebracht. Dank dieses dieses fehlerhaften Systems äh, in, in, in geht es uns so gut wie noch nie zuvor. Äh, das gilt nicht nur für reiche Länder, das gilt besonders auch für die Entwicklungs- und Schwellenländer, die in den letzten Jahrzehnten enorm aufgeholt haben. Dank des Handels, dank Kapitalismus und als im Zentrum äh, dieses Systems stecken oft Schulden, äh, stecken oft die Möglichkeit von Staaten auch äh, zu investieren in äh, Infrastruktur, in Bildung, in äh, die Zukunft des, des Landes. Not everyone benefits from our system, and debt has become a trap for many. The world must act in everybody's interest, because behind all debts are human beings and human destinies.